Welcome to C3 San Diego. Need something fresh, real, and powerful in your life? Connect with us on social media, get live stream service notifications, podcasts, and up-to-date information on upcoming events. We are so glad you're joining us for a powerful, life-transforming message from one of our C3 San Diego pastors. We would love to hear about how God is impacting your life through this ministry. Please share your experience with us at info at c3sandiego.com. If you'd like to be a part of what C3 Church is doing in the city of San Diego and beyond, you can contribute financially by going to c3give.com and choosing the giving option that works best for you. We hope you enjoy this message. I'm not sure if you saw the movie last year, Downsizing with Matt Damon. Uh, okay, that was pretty quiet. Okay, <laughs> nobody saw it. I'm not sure if that's a, that's a good thing or a bad thing, but... Um, as the church gets bigger, it's so important that our, that our focus gets smaller. One of the testimonies we've heard over and over again is that, you know, people would join our church when it was small, saying, oh, we left such and such because it was getting too big and we were feeling lost. And I just thought, oh, well, you know, if, if everybody joins here because they left there because it got too big and they felt lost or disjointed or disconnected, then golly gosh, we don't want to be the same. We don't want to just kind of repeat the same yeah. offense. And then as we get bigger, people feel lost and feel disconnected. So therefore, as the church gets bigger, our focus has to get smaller. Our focus has to get smaller. And one of the ways we do that is through connect groups. Connect groups. Let me just say this. You should not try to do life alone. You should not try and do life alone. The first thing God said wasn't good was for man to be alone. First thing God said is not good for man to be alone. And you know what's interesting is that Adam wasn't alone. Adam wasn't alone. He walked with God. God walked with Adam in the cool of the day each and every day. And this is before sin. So there was no separation between Adam and God. Adam saw God with unfiltered lenses. Adam had perfect and unbroken fellowship with God. This is how I know the God of the Bible is the true God. Because every other God that you read about, whether it's Allah, whether it's Buddha, whatever, every other God is capricious and demanding. Only a God who's completely secure in himself can look into Adam. And this is what God, when God said it's not good for man to be alone, this is what God was saying. He was literally saying, hey, Adam, now catch this, this is going to mess your head, but it's good. You need to get your head messed with in church. God is literally saying, when God said it's not good for man to be alone, he said, Adam, I am not enough. Only a God who is completely secure. Adam is walking with God. He is surrounded by the most amazing creatures, giraffes and zebras. I mean, everything. And he walks with God and God looks at Adam and says, it's not good for him to be alone. Adam, the Bible doesn't say that Adam was lonely. The Bible doesn't say that Adam was feeling despondent, disconnected, was looking at all the you know, animals paired off and there's no one. It doesn't say that. God actually looked into, that's what, that's what true love does. It recognizes a need in somebody else and then sacrificially goes to meet it. God said it's not good that man should be alone. I am not enough. Now, I know that we sing, Jesus, you're all I need. Jesus, you're all I need. And absolutely, to get to heaven, Jesus is all you need. But in this life, you need more than Jesus. Let me just go a little bit deeper. When you meet people that don't do connection and relationship, but they, you know, they, they do this, they are weird people. They are out of balance people. They are out of balance people. I was just with, 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 a, with a couple and, you know, the, the, the years and years of marriage issues just swept under the rug, swept under the rug, finally got too much. And so I said, well, what did you do? You know, well, you know, we're separated. But what we did was we, we did 40 days of prayer and fasting, you know, for God to heal. And I said, well, you don't understand. Like, and, and, and they're like, well, surely that would fix it. And it's a noble thing. And you, you would think, well, as a pastor, you ought to be encouraging people to do that. And absolutely, I think it's a good thing to seek the Lord. But I said to them, even at the end of 40 days of prayer and fasting, all that you would have done is healed this. And God may have healed your heart and healed your grievances, but you unfortunately still have to go back to this. 
How many people know that the cross is this? A young lady came up after the 8.30, she said, oh, did you realize when you were doing that, that that was the cross? I'm like, oh, sweetheart, you picked it up. <laughs> How beautiful. That's exactly what it is. Because Jesus didn't die just to, to repair this. He also died to repair this. And it wasn't, it wasn't God causing the bad marriage. It was, it was dysfunction causing the bad marriage. So you need to be in a connect group. You need to be around other people. It is not good for man to be alone. You need to be around other people as iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And there's something about other humans. Well, hang on, I don't, I don't like other humans. They let me down, they smell. They're obnoxious, they, you know, they're rude, they're exactly. Because the only way you get to exercise the muscle of forgiveness, the only way you get to exercise the muscle of grace and mercy and long suffering, you know, one translation is patience, but the proper translation is long suffering, <laughs> is around other people. Because there are times, there are times where you're like, I love the Lord, my God. I want to murder them. I, you know, and, it's, and, and you're going to find there are bipolar moments. I just love Jesus, but I want to kill everyone. And, and you're going to be in those moments. And that's how you grow. You actually grow. You, you know, I, I left the church. Oh, why'd you leave it? I got offended. You got offended. How did you get if somebody was rude to me? I've eaten in restaurants where the waiter was rude. I still eat in restaurants. Yeah, but you don't understand. I got hurt. I got hurt in church. Don't go to church. I got hurt. I, I got hurt snowboarding. I still love snowboarding. I got hurt surfing. I still love surfing. Oh, yeah, but you, you don't understand. You don't understand. Like, I had a bad experience. I had a bad experience with Indian. With Indian food. But if you said to me, what's one of your top three favorite foods? Indian. I still eat any food. But when it comes to the church, it's like, what do we, we need to raise people with some backbone. Now listen, the only way that you grow, the only way that you grow is you got to be around some people that don't have it all together where you're like, oh, sugar. You need some old sugar moments. Anyway, so our goal, our goal is as the church gets bigger to make sure that our emphasis is smaller so we can grow bigger people. As the church gets bigger, we want our, our emphases to be smaller. We want to make sure that every single person that walks through this church feels love, feels welcome, and feels that they can find a place where they can connect and do life with other people. The Bible says one sets flight to a thousand, two, ten thousand. There's something powerful that the devil wants to rob you of, of just trying to get you to soldier it alone, get you to go alone. The Bible says two are better than one. If one falls down, who can help him up? But if he has someone with him, he can help him up. Two are better than one. One can be overpowered, but two can withstand him. Two are better than one. You, you need other people in your life. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, let me just say this. The Bible calls that discipleship. Discipleship is in a church, you doing life with other people. That's how God disciples. But the goal of discipleship is for God to deal with the little things in our life that make a big difference. Discipleship is God being able to deal with the little things. Because you know what? If you just do life by yourself and it's easier because you can just wear the facade to church because nobody sees into your world. So you can walk into church blessed and highly favored and you've got that, you've got that, sh 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 that veneer all polished and you look like super Christian. Oh, you don't even have bad breath. You're so anointed. I used to use links, but not anymore. I got anointed, and now my underarms don't even sweat. <laughs> but we need other people in our lives, and it's the little things. Did, did you know that little things have big impacts? See, in, in this movie that came out, Downsizing, the, the, the whole emphasis was this, uh, you know, th theory that the that the earth is overpopulated and overcrowded and therefore they're shrinking people down to five inches and they're creating these little dollhouse communities for them and and eighty thousand dollars here in this world in that world equivalent you know is equivalent to 12.5 million and you can live in mansions and all this kind of stuff and so all these people are you know going through the procedure it's non-reversible and they go back only to find that when they get into this so-called perfect 
utopian existence that they they have the same issues and the same greed and the same struggles and the same loneliness and the same insecurities and the same crime and the same backbiting there because how many people know that wherever you go there you are see sometimes we think well if I just change geography Maybe I just, if I just change jobs, if I change my haircut, if I change my clothing, if I change my fashion style, if I change my spouse, then everything will be different. But this is what I've discovered. Every issue in my life actually is revealed by the world around me, but it's, it's actually something that is internally in me. So we think the conflict, because it's being exposed by my spouse, it's being exposed by my job, it's being exposed by my friends, it's being exposed by my community, it's being exposed. We think if we just change that, but it's actually not that. I can save you a heck of a lot of money. It's actually not that. It's what's happening on the inside of you. It's actually what the, the, the changes happen on the inside of you. And so today I want to talk about three little things that have big impacts. Now, I discovered that little things can have a big impact when Leanne and I were in New Zealand. We were youth pastors and we decided that it wouldn't it be a great thing to take our youth leaders. We're thinking, what, what kind of bonding event can we do with our youth leaders? And we came up with whitewater rafting. Now, New Zealand is different to San Diego because San Diego has 300 days of sunshine a year. New Zealand has 300 days of rain a year. Well, this was three weeks of torrential downpours where all the rivers and everything swollen. And so grade three rivers were now grade five. And they closed the, uh, the rivers, they closed the whitewater rafting down because it was, uh, you know, the, the, the rivers were flooded. And, and so anyway, our booking was there and they couldn't find another date. They said, listen, why don't you just come on down? <laughs> now, right there, I should have realized as the youth pastor, I'm putting lives in jeopardy. So anyway, we get there. And because I found out that I was a youth pastor, I was going to be in the guinea pig, I mean, in the first boat <laughs> to see if the river was safe. And so we're coming to this one, one waterfall. It's a grade five waterfall. And I'm, I'm in the front and, uh, and the, the guide's in the back. And, and to go over this waterfall, it's about a 30-foot waterfall. To go over this waterfall, he says, what we're going to do is we're going to paddle really, really hard to get the nose out. And, uh, and then uh, when I give the command, you drop and you put the, the th and you lay back so that, you know, it goes like this. So next to me is a young lady who, God bless her heart, I brought her because confidence wasn't her strong suit. <laughs> now, see, you're smarter than me. You already, you, you can already see where this is going. I'm like the eternal optimist. She's going to get it, you know. And so... <laughs> So he literally parks us behind a rock and, the, and it's rushing and, and all you can see is water here and then it just drops. I'm like, oh dear Jesus. And from here, it doesn't look 30 feet, it looks like 300 feet. And so he says, this is what we have to do. Everybody has to paddle hard as they can. We've got to get as much speed as we can to get the nose over so that we don't go nosedive. And uh, that's what we got to do. And everyone's got to paddle. And when I give the command, not before, when I give the command, you know, and we're like, you know, so I'm like, okay, so now, and so we're all paddling like this. Well, we get about maybe 15 feet from, from the edge, and she goes, I can't do it, I can't do it. And she just throws herself. And so when she stops paddling, and I'm still paddling like this, because I'm paddling. So instead of going straight over, we go over, and all I hear is him. Now, listen, I'm not meant to cuss in church, so I'm not going to cuss, but all I hear is the guide in the back go, shh, and uh, we just went. Now, you know when the, when, the, when the guide is cussing, when the last thing you hear is you go over a 30-foot waterfall, the guide, can, you know it's not going to be good. And all I remember is just going, oh... And uh, the next move underwater. Now, what they taught us is when you go under, don't go flat and don't try and fight because the, the water is pushing you down. Just let the, put yourself into a ball so you have the smaller surface area and it'll push you right down, but you'll spin and, and come back out. Well, I'm, I'm a surface, so I can hold my breath. I, I reckon I was under there getting pummeled for about 30 seconds and, and I come up. I thought I was going to be the last person up. I thought, man, you know, I must have hit in the, the part of the rapids where it just kept pinning me down. And I came up and I look around. I'm the first one up. And now I'm like, oh, dear Jesus, you know, now I've got to explain to parents how I drowned their kids. And, uh, and then, fum, 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 you know, these little heads came up and it, everyone was present and accounted for. And then they called the rest of the thing off saying it was too dangerous. 
There were 12 of us in this, in this raft. One person, one person quit. Little things can make a big difference. Little things can make a big difference. If you don't believe little things can make a big difference, talk to Pharaoh. One day Pharaoh's just kind of pharaohing on his throne. And his daughter comes in, she, and, you know, and she's carrying a little bundle. And he's like, what's that? It's a little baby. I, I found him in the river. Oh, can I keep him? Can I keep him? And uh, the Bible says when she pulled him out, it was like a little Hebrew child. Now, he'd made a decree that every male Hebrew child was to be drowned in the Nile River. And so Moses was in that same Nile River, but in, in a little basket Mama made. And she picks him out and, she, and, you know, like a little lost puppy. She's like, oh, Dad, please go and keep him. I promise I'll feed him. Oh, please. And so he's like, well, what can it hurt? <laughs> what a little baby. A little three-month-old baby. His counselors are like, uh, sir, you gave a decree. You know, everybody, well, what can, come on, look at him. He's harmless. He's just a little three-month... It's amazing how that little baby, that little three-month-old, ends up destroying the dynasty of the pharaohs of Egypt because a little thing... Come on, how many people know that little things become big things? Little things become big things. A little flirt, a little crossing of the line, a little... It's amazing how little things can have big impacts. It was a little thing. December 1, Montgomery, Montgomery Alabama, 1955, that one woman, Rosa Parks, refused to go to the back of the bus. Refused to go to the back of the bus. And an entire civil rights movement broke out because of one person. Little things have big impacts. Abraham has a promise from God that he's going to have more descendants than the stars in the sky. And 20 years later, it hasn't happened for him. So his wife makes a suggestion. Well, if I can't produce children, why don't you sleep with my handmaiden, Hagar? Maybe I can rear children through her. So you'll you notice that Abraham doesn't argue. <laughs> no, no, the scriptures say that I shouldn't. <laughs> oh, you're good with that? Okay. <laughs> Ladies, men are dumb. That's just the first key with a marriage. Just assume. I go to the cupboard. I go to the cupboard. Leanne, where on earth are they? And she's like, it's right in front of you. Right? I'm like, it wasn't there. It wasn't there 10 seconds ago. I swear it wasn't there. It was right. You girls play like mind tricks on us, don't you? Anyway, and so, so Abraham, you know the story. He sleeps with Hagar, produces Ishmael. And today... You know, God prophesies and says, Ishmael will be a wild man. His hand will be against his brothers all the days of his life. Twelve nations will come from him. Today, the conflicts and the bloodshed in the Middle East that have been happening for thousands of years happened because of one indiscretion thousands of years ago in a desert in a tent with Abraham and Hagar and everything. Don't tell me that little things don't have big impacts. Little things have big impacts. Somebody say amen. So let me, give you, let me give you three areas that I believe, three little things in our life that make big impacts. The first one is what I call uh, the eye, but the scripture says a bountiful eye will be blessed. Come with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 9. The book of Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 9. It says that he that has a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he gives. Everyone say gives. Yeah. For he gives of his bread to the poor. He who has a bountiful eye. Well, what is a bountiful eye? It's not beautiful eye. It says bountiful eye. Bountiful means to, to a, a, abound, means to have more than enough, means to be generous. Some translation says he who has a generous eye, who, who, he who has big thinking. It's amazing. The world that you and I live in is largely determined by the way that you see it. It's determined by the way that you see. Now, you may say, well, hang on, Pastor, that's easy for you. You're one of those glass half full people. You're always positive. You're always optimistic. It's like, you know, the twins. There were these twins. One was a pessimist. The other one was an optimist. And, uh, you know, every, every birthday they give them the same gifts. Every Christmas they give them the, the same gifts so there wouldn't be any fighting. And, and, and the optimist, you know, he's like, oh, my gosh, I love this. my favorite toy. And, and, and the pessimist is like, oh, I hate this. It's the worst day ever. Batteries are 
probably aren't going to work and it's probably going to break. And so this, this, the, the parents don't know what to do. They're like, man, this is crazy. So they get in a psychiatrist and he says, listen, do this, do this. You've got to balance things out. He says, this Christmas, for the, for the pessimist, just get him the best of everything. Get him the best of everything. But for the optimist, who's always positive, always positive, buy, just get a big barrel of manure. And so the parents are like, whoa, that's a little extreme. Well, you've got to balance them out. And so, you know, Christmas morning comes and un there under the Christmas tree is just all these beautiful gifts. And he's got a brand new Xbox and, and uh, he's got the, uh, the, the uh, Nintendo Switch. And, and they're thinking he's going to be really happy. And he's like, oh, you know, the, the TV's probably not going to work. And oh, what if, you know, what if I go online and you've got to, and credit card doesn't work. And then, and, and he's just, ne and they're like, oh, dear Jesus, he's just negative. And then they're like, oh, you know, and, and the optimist is like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, there are no presents under the tree for me. My present must be so big you can't fit. You're the best parents in the world. And they're like, oh, no, how do we do this? Son, go up into your bedroom. And up in the bedroom, they, they put a half ton of horse manure. That's his gift. And they're like, oh, this is terrible. And he opens up the door. And he goes, Mom, Dad, you guys are the best. And he dives into the manure. And he's in the manure and he's on his hands and knees and the parents are like feeling really, really bad. And they're like, we're so sorry, we're so sorry. Oh, come on, mum and dad, you can't fool me. Where there's this much manure, there's got to be a pony. <laughs> the Bible says he who has a bountiful eye will be blessed. Do you know, uh, we were just with, uh, with family, obviously, for, for my son's wedding. And one of my brother-in-laws was telling me about his parents who are multimillionaires. And yet every year they go to a particular show and they stay in the cheapest motel. Because before they were millionaires, that's the motel they stayed in. And mum every year brings a toaster. <laughs> just in case dad gets hungry and so she needs to make him something to eat in the middle of the night. And so my brother-in-law's like, mum, dad, you do realize they have hotels that you can afford because you're multimillionaires that actually have room service 24 hours around the, but they're like, oh, no, 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 we, we can't. This is the motel we stay in and, and mama brings her toaster. They can enjoy this kind of lifestyle, but they don't, they, they have money. Their circumstances have changed, but their eyes still has it. If you, if you study your history, you will find there was a woman called Hetty Green. Hetty Green was known as the Witch of Wall Street. The Witch of Wall Street. In 1906, she was worth an estimated between 100 and 200 million dollars. Today, that's in the billions. Six billion dollars uh, would be the, the lighter side of what she was worth. She was the richest woman in America. But she was known for her miserliness. She had one black dress. That's why they called her the Witch of Wall Street. She lived in an apartment in Manhattan, but refused to let her children turn on the heating when it snowed in winter and refused to let them use hot water. She would send her, her, she would send her kids out to go and buy the paper so she could read, and, and that's how she monitored the stock and the stock market because she was on Wall Street. And then she would send her kids straight back out to resell the, the papers an hour, two hours later. She hated to spend money. When Ned, her eldest son, broke his leg, uh, sledding with his buddies, she didn't want to take him to the hospital because she didn't want to pay. So she dressed him in pauper clothes and she disguised herself and she went down to the pauper hospital but ran out when they, when they recognized her. She ran out with her boy because she didn't want to pay for, for uh, any, any medical treatment for his broken leg. Well, instead of his leg getting better, his leg got worse and worse till gangrene set in and they ended up having to, to amputate his leg. When she died, she literally left a fortune that it took 116 attorneys, 116 attorneys to, to decipher. And her kids squandered all of her wealth because they were, they, they were so broken and so dysfunctional because they had a mama who had all the wealth in the world but refused to spend one penny. She had wealth. She was the wealthiest woman in America, but she did not have a bountiful eye. She had a miserly eye. Can I just tell you, the Bible says, he who has a bountiful eye will be blessed. Now, let me just say this. There is a lie that many people believe. And the lie is this, that if, if somebody is blessed, if somebody prospers, if somebody becomes rich, therefore somebody else has to be poor. 
If somebody becomes because what they say is, and this is the, the vernacular that they use, and we just accept it, oh, oh, that's so right. You know, that if someone gets a big piece of the pie, someone else has to have a small piece. If God or if this world was a pie, but nowhere in the Bible does it describe God as a pie. In fact, the Bible describes God as a river. That God is a river. And so that a river means that whether you're rich or poor, whether you're black or white, whether you're tall or short, whether you were born in Germany like me, or whether you're born in the United States of America, if you jump into God's river, God is no respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of his principles. And it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your education. You may be a high school dropout or you may be a Harvard graduate. If you apply God's principles to your life, they will work and you will be blessed and you will prosper. If you reject them, you reject them to your own demise. But every single person, person equal opportunity if God blesses this one it doesn't mean that God can't bless you in fact if anything a bountiful life says man if God can bless them then I need to sit with them and I need to ask them and tell me what principles did you apply to your life so I can begin to apply those to my life because the Bible says God even causes his rain to fall on the wicked and the just he causes his sun to shine on the wicked and the just God is a God of blessing but if you don't have a bountiful eye you'll begin to envy and you'll begin to cover can I just tell you the most miserable people on the planet are people who are envious and coveting do you know one of our one of our friends in Australia who's an extraordinary uh, worship leader and recording artist uh, was sitting on a plane and because of her status because of how much she flies because she's in demand all over the world they uh, they bumped her up because of her status into business class and she's sitting there in business class and a lady walks past and recognizes her sitting in business class and immediately starts piping off. Business class, business class, that's it, I'm not buying another one. Of those albums, business class. And made this person like feel embarrassed and feel ashamed for getting an upgrade. Now she bought the same ticket as this lady. She bought a ticket in economy, but because of how much she traveled and because you know people recognized her, the, the, the airline wanted to bless her. This other person, had such an issue with coveting, had such an issue with envy that she made sure that she was not going to enjoy business class, that's it, and made her, you don't want to be that person. That's a miserly person. That's a miserly spirit. That's a small world. God wants to deliver you from that world. Do you know what the Bible says? Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, can I just let you in a little bit, little bit of a secret? I need to be in church every week. Well, hang on, but you're the pastor. I'd love to tell you that the, the day I graduated from college, the day I graduated from seminary, I no longer struggled with sin. Oh, yeah, the day I graduated from Bible school, my character was like perfect, like me and Jesus. Like, I still today, I'll hear a story about someone who, you know, was successful and they lost everything, and there's a part of me on the inside going, yippee! I'm like, will you shut up if people say, oh, that's terrible. That's, give me, shut up. And, and I'm rejoicing over there, weeping. And then when someone is, you know, is, is weeping, it's like, man, what is wrong with me? I find that I need to be in church and I need to remind myself, the Bible says, he who has a bountiful eye will be blessed. How many people want the blessing of God to rest on them? Make a decision, make a decision. You know what, I'm gonna bless. I'm gonna have a bountiful eye. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bless and I'm gonna rejoice with those who are rejoicing. I'm gonna see the big picture. I'm gonna be somebody that, that steps into a larger world. Someone say amen. The second one, the second little thing is found in the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon 2.15, the Shunammite who's marrying Solomon says these words. This is beautiful love poetry in, in the book of Song of Solomon. Song, Song of Solomon. Solomon is marrying this, this beautiful young lady. And, the, and they're writing. It's, it's just gorgeous. And then she says this to him. She says, come, let us catch the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. Or literally in the NIV, our, our vines are in bloom. But it's interesting because nobody wants to, to catch the, the little foxes. No one wants to exterminate. They're so cute. Like if I put a photo up here of a little fox, you'd be, oh, they're so cute. Oh my gosh, can we get one? Like they just look so cute. But because they're little foxes, they can't reach the grapes. So what they do is they eat the roots. And if you eat the roots of any tree, if the root system is eaten away, the tree can't get any nutrients, and so the tree dies. So here are these cute little things 
that can ruin an entire vineyard. And the vernacular, obviously, in the story is that your, your marriage relationship is like a vineyard that's meant to produce the, the, the finest wine, the most beautiful wine. And yet the Shunammite says, come, let us catch the little foxes. You know, I've been married 26 years to this young lady this month. 26 years married to, to Leanne. Now you're clapping me. Don't clap me. Clap, clap her. It's been easy for me. I'm married to Leanne for her. She tells everyone would have, she would have got less for a double homicide. And I don't know what that means. But anyway, I'm sure it's something encouraging. I just believe. Come on. That's amazing, baby. And you can do it easily. And uh, that didn't go well. But anyway, so, uh, so what I've found in 26 years of marriage because we've seen some marriages come and go with, with other people, and especially as a pastor, walking through stuff, I found that in almost every circumstance, what ruined the marriage wasn't some massive tragedy or calamity. It was actually years and years and years of neglecting the little foxes. It was little grudges. It was little issues that were never addressed. You will find it's the little things that have big impacts. She says, let us catch the foxes, the little foxes which spoil the vines. It's, it's the little bitterness. It's the little unforgiveness. It's the little indiscretion. It's the little things that annoy. It's the little things. And what most couples do is they sweep them under the rugs because when you marry somebody, you don't just marry them. You marry them and their history. Now, I tell everyone, getting married is like flying southwest. When you turn up at Southwest, you're in the manifest. They know you're coming. Your name's in the manifest. But the first question they ask is, how many bags are you bringing? They know you're coming, but the question is, how much baggage are you bringing? Now, now a lot of airlines will have a one bag allowance. Anything after that you've got to pay for. I would love to tell you that when I got married, I only brought one bag with me. I had, eh, 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 eh. I had so many bags. Leon, like, what the heck is all? Is my bag? Do you know what ruins me? It's the bag. It's not the person. You fell in love with the person. It's the baggage that destroys the marriage. And so, marriage is learning how to be a good baggage handler. But what we do is, is you know, Leanne sees my baggage and grabs it and hits me over the head with it. And then I'm like, well, I've got to retaliate. What about your baggage? And I grab her bag, and next one, keep going, kids, and we're bashing each other in the head with our baggage. Marriage is, is the unraveling and the dealing with each other's baggage. If I go a little bit deeper, let me just tell you this. Marriage is, is actually lowering the drawbridge. The drawbridge. Too, too often we're, we're two fortified castles. And, and, and if you hurt me, I'll hurt you right back. And the person who hurts the hardest or hurts the most, well, that's the person who wins the argument. The person who cuts the other one down, or, that, that's, all, that's, all you do is you fortify. One of the saddest things I see is, is uh, uh, you know, people who are, well, you know, we decided to stay together for the kids. What? That's not God's best. Now, absolutely, it's noble, stay together for the kids, but don't end there. That's the beginning, not the end. The begin if you can just deal with the little foxes, if you can begin to deal with, let me just say this to you. Well, you know, uh, we just never argue. Do you live in the same address? <laughs> I'm always nervous. Yeah, you know. Wait, I'm like, do you guys sleep in the same bed? How could you never? That you're going to have conflict. You're going to have a few sparks. You're going to have those moments. It's so important that you actually learn. So one of the things that Leanne and I have done is we try to every single day have a coffee. Now, it's easier because there are so many good coffee shops around serving flat whites in San Diego. Gloria Dios. But I've actually found that it, it's less about the coffee and it's more about the connection. And what the goal of every marriage is to lower the drawbridge, my drawbridge, where she has access to cross my defenses, come right into where I'm most vulnerable. Now, it's taken 26 years of marriage, but I can trust her with the things that I'm embarrassed about, the things that I'm insecure about, 
the things that I would react if she saw a weakness, if she saw a flaw in me, I, I would react because I thought if she sees that, maybe she'll reject me like everybody else. If she sees my struggle, if she sees my weakness, if she sees this. But after 26 years, she, is, she has earned the right. She has proven her love that I can show her even my weaknesses and my struggles and she can come in. And I'm telling you, when you hit that in a marriage, that is when you become better. Listen, marriage is God's way of making you what you could never be on your own. When God said to Adam, it's not good for you to be alone, I will make a helper comparable, it's because Adam needed help. Now, no man likes to admit that. But Adam could never be all that he could be by himself. I know that I am who I am today because of this extraordinary lady on the front row who has had... You know, at first it was survival, but then over the years it moved from survival to permission with courage to talk to me about all kinds of things from snoring, breath, the way I speak in public, addressing things that I shouldn't address in public, uh, not disconnecting on my phone, my driving. Oh, dear Jesus, leave my driving alone. But yeah, my driving. I'm like, can't I just get in the car and just not be a Christian? Just on the freeway, just... It's only a 25 minute drive home just for 25 minutes. Can I just? But unfortunately, no. <laughs> Let us catch the, the last one. The last one, because I hear the keys up. The last one is an untamed tongue. James 3. James 3 is amazing. James 3, verse 4 says, Take ships as an example. Although they are large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue. The Bible says your tongue is like the rudder on a ship. A giant ship is turned by a little rudder. James is writing saying your entire life is set. The course is directed by your tongue, by your tongue. It says the tongue is an unruly evil set on fire by hell. The tongue is so powerful. Now, how many people know that God delivered over a million Israelites out of Egypt with a mighty hand, 10 judgments, turning water into blood, you know, everything. He brings them through to a Red Sea where he opens the Red Sea. And, and a million Israelites walk through on dry ground with walls of water on their right, walls of water on their left. When they get into the desert, now a desert is a desert. No one lives in the desert because there's no water. There's no shelter. It's extreme. It's hot at, during the day and then freezing at night. So God is a pillar of cloud by day, shelter. And he's a pillar of fire by night, warmth. The Bible says that he brought a river out of a rock for them to drink. He brought manna from heaven. He brought quail. Whatever they asked for, God provided. He provided for them for 40 years. And yet that generation didn't make it across the, the, the Canaan into the promised land. Sorry, across the Jordan River into Canaan, the promised land. It wasn't because God ran out of power. In fact, most Bible scholars will tell you it was an 11 day journey. And yet 40 years later, they were still in the desert. And if you read it, the reason they didn't make it in was because of their complaining. It was because of their negativity. It was because their confession was it is hopeless. It was their confession was it can't be done. It was their confession is that, that there are giants in the land. The cities are fortified. It's a land that devours its inhabitants. The people are too numerous. They are mightier than we are. We were like grasshoppers in our sight. We were like grass. Their confession, they, they, they walked. They had the baptism where God opened the Red Sea and they saw walls of water when they got to the other side and they saw the Egyptian chariots coming behind them with Pharaoh. Rah! Ra driving the chariots with the greatest warriors. And then they saw Moses stretch out his hand and drown the entire Egyptian army. Egypt went from the most powerful nation to the most vulnerable nation in one moment. They saw this. There were eyewitnesses. And yet they wouldn't change the disposition on the inside. They kept speaking out of their pain. They kept speaking out of their past. They allowed the pain of their past that they were slaves for 400 years dictate the way that they spoke. And they spoke it as hopeless. They spoke we are victims. They said, we're like grasshoppers in our side. We're like grasshoppers. In it was their confession. When, when, uh, when uh, Nimrod was building the Tower of Babel, for God to disrupt that project, He didn't send a fire. He didn't send a flood. To disrupt the project, all He had to do was change the language. When He confused the language, everything fell down. The Bible says, death and life is in the power of the tongue, and those who love it shall eat its fruit. 
a lot of marriages struggle because Proverbs 31, 28 says that this woman is extraordinary because her children rise and call her blessed. Her husband also and he praises her. Verse 29, many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. His language creates a culture in the home that causes her to thrive, that causes her to flourish. Everything rises and falls on your tongue. When Jesus was, was standing on, the, on the, the platform beside Pontius Pilate, and all the people are yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate's interceding, saying, but why? What crime has he committed? And they're yelling stuff out. And then Pilate's looking at Jesus thinking, come on, dude, help me here. I'm trying to save your life. And he looks at Jesus and says, sayest thou nothing? Don't you hear these accusations that they make? Do you not realize that this day I have power? I have authority to decide whether you live or whether you die. You know, he's just saying, come on, Jesus. You're out there as an orator. You're out there preaching. Save yourself. Listen to what these people are saying. Defend yourself. And he says, I have authority to decide this day whether you live or whether you die. And Jesus says, you would have no authority over me unless it was given to you from above. He says, right now, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight for my deliverance. But my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate says, I knew it. You are a king then. Listen to what Jesus says. He said, it is as you say. See, Jesus knows who he is, but that doesn't save you. Jesus knows who he, he, he knows he's the Messiah. Or you can call him rabbi, you can call him teacher, you can call him, you know, an exalted guru, a mystic or whatever. It's your confession. Romans 10 verse 9 says, He who believes that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, confesses with his mouth, shall be saved. For with the heart one believes, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus knows who he is, but he says to Pilate, It is as you say. If you say I'm just a teacher, then to you I'll just be a teacher. But it is as you say. In this life it is as you say. When Leanne and I came to San Diego, people tried to tell us that, that there is a spirit it is very subtle and it, it will be in people close to you. There is a spirit and it'll, it'll, it'll find a, a voice in people close to you trying to tell you to put a ceiling over your life of what can or can't be done. When we got to San Diego, people, well-meaning people, didn't realize that having one of those Simon moments where Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. They said to us, oh, you can't build a big church in San Diego. San Diego is a preacher's graveyard. Uh, if you want to be spirit-filled, whatever you do, don't be spirit-filled. Don't be a spirit-filled church because the biggest spirit-filled church is 300. If you want a church bigger than 300, you can't be spirit -filled. And they began to tell us things, and I just, I just cancel, 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 cancel. I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to. So we began to confess differently. We began to say San Diego, a city for Christ. San Diego is going to be a house. A church where the power of God can travel, where the sick are going to be healed, where tumors and cancers are going to shrivel up and die, where people who couldn't have babies are going to find themselves pregnant, where people who walk in broke are going to begin to flourish, they're going to begin to prosper, where marriages, where marriages were hanging by a thread, they're going to find healing and health and restoration, where, where young people are going to discover the call of God, where old men are going to dream dreams, young men are going to see visions, where, where lives are going to change every single week. We're going to have a, a church where people can believe in the power of God and see the power move. We're going to have campuses everywhere. And we, we, began, we, we went against the grain. But I knew, I knew, listen to me, I know I'm out of time. I knew that, that if I, whatever I say, the tongue is so powerful. Death and life. Make a decision. I, ain't going to, I am not going to speak death. Remember Jesus walks up to a fig tree, sees leaves on it. And he sees no figs, he sees no fruit, and he says, let no one ever eat fruit from you again. The next day they come past and the disciples says, Lord, the fig tree you cursed, look at it, it's dead, shriveled up from the roots. And Jesus says, let that be a lesson, guys. That if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say. You can say to this mountain, be removed and it'll be removed. 
So he's saying that, that you have the power to shift the external world by the words that you say. But I want you to notice, they said, Lord, the fig tree you curse, but Jesus didn't say, I curse thee. Jesus just said, let no one ever eat fruit from you again. The tongue is so small, but, but you may say, man, San Diego is too expensive to buy a home. You may say, man, you know, the taxes are too high to live here. We can't prosper here. You gotta be careful, man, I'm so, man, I'm never gonna get ahead. Man, I'm never gonna get married. Man, I'm never. Sometimes we gotta zip it.com. You need to understand God wants to bless you. Many years ago, many years ago, I was kind of having a moment with God, having a moment with God, that we'd bought some land in Australia that we were trying to sell and it wasn't selling. So I'm like, okay, just, I need some. And so God had always taught me, the Holy Spirit had always taught me to be quite frank with God. You know, and if you ever see a big pile of ashes, I was maybe too frank. <laughs> the heck is that pile of ashes? Oh, that was pastor. <laughs> but so far, I haven't been turned into a pile of ashes. But I have been very frank with God. Just trying to be honest. So I'm like, okay, God, I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> serving you in San Diego and I have asked repeatedly for you to take care of this issue with my land back in Australia. Three times it went into escrow, three times it's fallen out of escrow. Is it too hard for you? Just tell me. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the, the sanitized version. So God then says to me, he says, how can I bless what you keep cursing? I'm like, I beg your pardon. <laughs> and then he's, you know, because God just goes, fum, 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 shows me where I was with some people. And they're like, oh, you know, how's it go? Well, you know, it's pretty difficult right now. And I began to, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. And I began to talk about how difficult it was. And we had this land back in Australia and the markets turned and it's, you know, the market's dead and no one's looking to buy an acre and it's costing us $4,800 a month and we're hemorrhaging money, trying to get their sympathy and their compassion. And God says, you can either have man's sympathy or my power, but right now your confession, you would rather their sympathy than my power. And I realized I was trying to, I was cursing with my, my confession was it's hard, it's difficult, nothing's selling, trying to, get the, trying to get them to feel sorry for the pastor. And I had to repent. I had to repent and then I had to begin to change my confession. Everything's selling. The land's gonna be sold like that. God's hands on it. God's, within a month it's sold. Within a month it's sold. What changed? The market didn't change, same market. The buyers didn't, same buyers. In fact, the guy who went into escrow the first time was the guy who now came back and, and bought it. What changed was this. Death and life in the power of the tongue. A bountiful eye, little foxes, your tongue. Discipleship is the church gets bigger. We want to get smaller. To get smaller, God wants to deal with the little things in your life. And let me tell you, I, like you, am a master of hiding the little things behind facades if it was only about this. We want you to be in a connect group. We want you to be doing life with other people because it'll force you to deal with the little things. And we want you to deal with the little things because the little things have big impacts. My desire, Leanne's desire for you is that you would flourish, that you would say, man, since we joined C3, our life has just gone up and up and up. Everything, everything has just began to flourish. Our marriage, our relationships, our friendships, our finances, our walk with God, our under, everything should flourish. Psalm 92 says, those who are planted in the house of God, blessed are they, they shall flourish. We wanna see you flourish, amen. Amen, come on, if you believe that today, give God a great shout. Those of you watching online, Das Vidanya, Paka, it was great to have you with us, but every head bowed, every eye closed. You know, if you're here today and Maybe you're away from God, you're far from God. In the last 30 seconds, would you let me just say a prayer for you? Maybe you're here and, and just between you and God, there seems to be a big gulf, a big distance. Let me just tell you, that's actually quite easy to get there. The world that we live in is toxic towards God, 
toxic towards the kingdom of God. It'll offer you, you know, at every look, even when you're not looking, all kinds of vice, all kinds of sin designed to pull you away from God, to separate you from God. I find effortlessly I'm distant from God. But thank God for church every Sunday, church every week where I can come and reconnect my heart. If you're distant from God, would you come back today? Would you let me say a prayer for you to come back? Maybe you're here and you've never surrendered to God. Maybe it's your first time, friend. The greatest day is the day you surrender to Jesus. When Jesus came into my life in 1986, everything changed. Or maybe you're here today and maybe you once walked with God, but you slipped away, turned away, fell away, ran away. You're just away. I want to pray for you to come back. So if you're any one of those three categories, well, every head is bowed, every eye looked, uh, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're one of those three categories, would you quickly raise your hand and say, hey, pastor, that's me. I'm far from God, distant from God, away from God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Who else is there? Lift it up high so that I can see it. Thank you over there. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you up the back. I see your hand. Thank you. I feel like there's somebody else. Who is that person? God is knocking on your heart. Thank you, sweetheart. Someone, your heart's pounding in your chest. And God is saying, hey, surrender, surrender. Someone's been running from God. You need to turn around and run too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Still feel like there's someone else. Thank you, sweetie. I see your hand, darling. Who else is there? Thank you up there, young man. I see your hand. I still feel like there's one more. God's going after somebody. You grew up in a Christian home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You grew up in a Christian home. And unfortunately, you, you look at everything cynical because what you heard on Sunday didn't match up to what you saw Monday to Saturday. But God's about to shift things. Thank you, thank you. He's gonna show you that they may have not lived it, but there are people who are, and you can, you can. Thank you, thank you. You know, so many raise their hands and there are hands going up everywhere. Can we all say these words out loud? Say these words, say, Dear Heavenly Father, I wanna thank you today. You so love me. You sent Jesus Christ, your only son, on a rescue mission to save my soul. Lord Jesus, thank you that you picked up that cross and gave yourself to be crucified, to take the full punishment of all my sin so that today I am free, I am forgiven. I declare today the devil has no more power over my life. I am a child of God. Heaven is my home and God is my Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on. Can we give all of those a raise their hands a great round of applause? I'm so proud of you. Standing over here is, uh, is some of our great team. Is that Morgan Irvin? Is it Morgan? He played Jesus in our, in our Hero of the Rock musical. He is one of the most brilliant, most beautiful, most magnificent men I've had the privilege of meeting in my life. He is magnificent. Everybody that raised their hands, what we want to do is we want to give you a Bible and we want to give you a book called Following Jesus. They're just our gifts to you. The Bible is God's manual on how to do life, but if you look at how thick that is, sometimes, whoa, where do I even start? 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New and Old Testament, New Testament, where do I start? So Following Jesus is a book written by one of our pastors here that just helps you to navigate. That's our gift to you. Now, if you raised your hand, make sure you see him in our response lounge, we want to give that to you. If you're sitting with someone that raised their hand, would you make sure that they get it? We're not going to uh, try and get you involved in any uh, network marketing pyramid scheme or anything like that. We just want to bless, we want to help you follow Jesus. Now, if you wanted to raise your hand, you can still go. If you know someone who needed to raise their hand, you can say, hey, listen, I want to get them a Bible. I want to get them. We just want to help you follow Jesus. We want to help you go to the next level. And everyone say tonight. Tonight, tonight right here at 5 p.m., this is a church that we want to continually raise and empower people. Tonight we have what we call a three by 10. A three by 10, what's a three by 10? We have three people handpicked who are gonna to preach tonight. They've got a, an assignment, they're preaching for 10 minutes each. Why is that? Well, we've got a vision for 16 campuses, so we better raise up more pastors and more preachers who know how to communicate. But let me just tell you this, I'm the pastor. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat in a three by 10 where it looks like, oh, isn't that sweet? Pastor is giving someone a go. And yet I'm sitting there and they share something that so rocks my world. Because can I just tell you, 
you have a little piece, a perspective of God that I don't have. And my life has become so much, much richer hearing your story about your walk with God, your journey, what you've walked through, what you're walking through, what you've overcome inspires me. So I love nothing more than us turning out and cheering on that next, the coming off the bench, coming onto the platform, coming onto the field. They're gonna be throwing touchdowns. They're gonna be trying to hit home runs. And man, there's nothing greater than us coming along. And, and I promise you, if you come in leaning in, you're gonna get something out of it. Thank you so much for joining us online. We hope you had a powerful experience. We want to take this time to personally help you navigate the next steps in becoming connected. If you made a decision for Christ today, need prayer, or want more information about our church, go to our website, c3sandiego.com. And if you didn't get a chance to give online during service and would like to contribute financially, you can go to c3give.com and click on the giving option that works best for you. We look forward to hearing from you. See you at church.